You know the last book of the Old Testament? Can you turn to it? The last book of the Old Testament? That, that's easy to find, right? The last book. It's uh, Malachi. Or if you're Italian, Malachi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> turn to Malachi chapter 3. And uh, I just want to uh, share some thoughts from a couple of verses in this third chapter. You know, on Wednesday nights, I don't, I, I do not normally have a series of messages that I'm going through. Normally on Wednesday nights, not always, but for the most part, I just try to take a devotional thought that God's given to me and develop it into something that I can share with you. And that's what this is this evening. So Malachi chapter 3, <clears throat> and I want to read, and you can read it with me, verses 16 and 17. Malachi 3, 16 and 17. Let's read it together. You ready? Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall, be, this is God speaking, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his son that serveth him. What an outstanding text those verses are. And what really amazes me is the knowledge of the fact that these verses that God spoke were spoken by him in a period of great spiritual darkness when the majority of the Israelites were in rebellion against God and were totally careless. They couldn't care less about God or his glory. They had absolutely no respect for the Lord. Listen to this. I'm reading from chapter 1, verse 6. This is God speaking to them. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts, unto you, O priests, listen to this, that despise my name, and say, how have we despised your name? Total disrespect for the Lord. They had absolutely no respect for him. However, here's a wonderful truth that I don't want you to ever forget, and that is this, that in the darkest days, in the worst times that you can imagine, God ever has a remnant that cleaves to him, that holds on to him. God never lets himself to be without a definite, clear witness to the truth that is necessary for human beings like you and I and others to be reconciled back to God, because that's what God's all about. We sang a lot of songs about the love of God tonight, because that's who God is. That's what he wants from you. He wants your love. He doesn't, uh, he, he, he doesn't demand it because love can't be demanded. It has to be freely given. And that's why you have a free will. You can choose to love God or not. And I hope that as a result of us being together tonight, that your love for him might be knocked up a couple of notches, as they say. So that's who God is speaking of in these verses that we've just read, these people that have no respect for him whatsoever. And also, if you go back to chapter 3 with me, here's the wonderful truth. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. Aren't you thankful that God never changes? Because you know how often we change, right? Our feelings change and we change. God says, I change not. 
He never changes. So you can be confident. You can confidently apply the wonderful verses that we just read, verses 16 and 17. You can apply those wonderful thoughts about God to yourself as well as Israel could to themselves. And that's how I want you to apply it tonight. While God is speaking to Israel, he wants us to apply these verses to ourselves. So let's look at them a little closer. Go back to verse 16 of chapter 3 of Malachi. And here you see the marks of a person that has a special relationship with God. See if this describes you in any way at all. What are the characteristics? What's the character of a person that has a special relationship with the Lord? Look at the verse with me. They that feared the Lord. They feared the Lord. You know what that means? They had reverence for him. They feared the Lord. They had an absolute awe that filled their heart to honor him. To fear the Lord is really a combination of love and trust of the Lord. To love him and trust him. If you love the Lord, if you truly love the Lord, you can trust him. I mean, in the worst circumstances, in the worst scenario that you ever have or will face, you can trust him. If you love the Lord, you trust him. That's what it means to fear the Lord. It's reverence. It's a combination of love and trust. It's living daily in, in the power of a God consciousness that's sincere. A sincere God consciousness. You know, I, I want to remind myself all the time. The Holy Spirit reminds me, obviously, to remind myself that he's in me. He's real. Jesus, through the Spirit of God, lives in my heart. He resides in me. He's always in me. And I want to be conscious of him. And I want to know his, his presence in my life on an ongoing basis. The character of people that are being described in these verses is, first of all, they have reverence. But look at what else they do. Verse 16. They spake often. Often. They spake often one to another. They not only have reverence toward the Lord, but they often have reflection upon the Lord. And I think that goes along with being God conscious. Would you consider yourself a God conscious person? Would you say that you're conscious of the Lord on a daily basis in your life? Now, I know there might be blackout periods, right? Where you just, for you, you might get overwhelmed for a moment or get distracted, and, and God's not in your thoughts at that moment. But overall, do you consider yourself to be a God-conscious person? It says that these people, their character was not only were they reverent, but they reflected upon God. They thought upon him. That word thought literally means to place a high value on who God is. Do you highly value God? It's the opposite of ignoring him. And you know what? It's easy to ignore him, isn't it? It's easy just to get caught up in the daily uh, affairs of life and, and just kind of ignore God. Forget about him. Think nothing of him. These people thought highly of him, and they thought often of him as well. In fact, it says that they spake often one to another. See that in, in the 16th verse? They met together not only to contemplate and to comprehend the deep riches of, of what they have in God, of being his, of having him, but they also talked about it. We'll mention that a little bit more in a moment. But let me ask you, 
What do you talk about more than anything else? I mean, if I, if I, if, if you and I hung out for a day, what would our conversation really be about mostly? You know, it really comes down to this. When you think about it in the final analysis, there really isn't anything else that is worthwhile considering. They spake often one to another of the Lord. I want you to see something else about these people. Again, verse 16. Not only their character, their conduct. Look at the wonderful way that they view God. And look at the wonderful way that God views them. First of all, in the 16th verse, they spake one to another. They verbalized their honorable God talk, if I could put it that way. They verbalized their thoughts, their contemplation, their comprehension of having God as their God. And it was something that they did mutually. It says in that 16th verse, that they spake often one to another. It wasn't just one person, but they were having a conversation together. It was a they were sharing together things of God with each other. They that's what fellowship is. You know, we talk about getting together and, and having a meal and, and fellowshipping together. Well, just eating a meal together is in fellowship. It's only fellowship when it's around the Lord and when he is really the, the subject of our conversation. They are verbalizing, they're sharing mutually together the things of God with each other. They're, they're gathering together and it's a community of hearts. And it's heart communing with heart that's taking place here. It's people that have a spirit, a kindred spirit in the right sense. Think of it this way. When you and I get saved, our human spirits are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We have a direct connection with God himself. He moves in and resides in our human spirit. We become partakers of the divine nature. That's what the Bible says. Well, that if you commune out of your regenerate human spirit that the Holy Spirit resides in with another believer, and that believer does the same, this is what he's talking about here. This is what God's viewing here. It's This is what people are doing. They're kindred spirits in that way. God's spirit and their spirit, and they're joined together in their mutual sharing together the things of God. Notice. Again, they spake often. It was something that was normal with them. Not forced, not phony. Talking about the Lord and the things of the Lord. It was just natural and normal. Uh, it, it was a regular daily habit with them. It was what they occupied themselves mostly in doing. To speak together exclusively about their Lord. You know, there's some people that do that. And it's natural. It's not uh, something they put on. It's real. That's what's the conduct of these people. So that's their character. That's their conduct. Well, what do you think God thought about that? Well, look at it. In verse 16, the Lord cherished what was going on. He cherished it. It says, the Lord hearkened. Look at the wonderful way that God views people that make him their subject of conversation. That make him the subject of their contemplation. God really likes this. Look at what he did. It says he hearkened, you know, for, what, 14 years? Our family had a little beagle. We loved that dog. He was, a, he was like a, a member of the family. And we we have some, you know, funny memories about uh, him. And one of the things is he loved 
to go for walks, right? And so we just sometimes just tease him and we'd say, we'll go for a walk. And when we said, want to go for a walk, his ears would go, whoop, <laughs> you know, they'd perk right up like that. That's what this word hearken means. God, I, uh, obviously God doesn't have ears. He's a spirit, right? But he wants us, he, he communicates with us on levels that we can understand. When we speak about God, when we talk about him, his ears, they're pricked up. He's listening. He's sensitive. God is sensitive because of his love for us. It says he hearkened because of the sensitivity of his love. But not only that, it says the Lord hearkened and heard it. Now, that's a different word. The, uh, heard means, you know, now, maybe a little a child is trying to tell you something and you can't quite get it. So you, you bend down and say, what did you say? That's what the word heard means. God's ears not only prick up to catch what we're saying about him, but he bends over not to miss one syllable of our conversation about him. That's how interested he is. That's how much he cherishes it. He wants to catch every intonation, every inflection of our voice, because it's like music to his ears when his people talk about him in reverence, and they reflect upon him, and they tell each other their thoughts about the Lord. He has an intense interest in that because of his love. Look at the 16th verse again. Here's something else he does. Not only does he perceive by hearkening and hearing, but he preserves what he hears. Look at it. And a book of remembrance was written before him. Now, obviously, as I said, God doesn't have ears. And God doesn't need a book of remembrance to be able to remember things like we do. You know, some people, they have to write down everything. Or they don't remember it. Um, now we put notes to ourselves on our phones, right? So we, that we don't remember it otherwise. So God doesn't have a memory problem, but this is so we can understand his intense interest because of his, the sensitivity of his love. He wants to preserve what he hears us talking about regarding him. A book of remembrance, literally, it's an honor scroll, <laughs> not an honor roll. You ever been on the honor roll in school? Mm -hmm. God has an honor roll or an honor scroll. It's called a book of remembrance here. And it pictures the fact that just as kings would have uh, uh, court uh, stenographers, I guess you would call them, that would uh, write down and chronicle the history of this king and his kingdom. The picture is that God registers in a journal, if you will, to be certain to recall it, like kings recording their own history chronicles. That's how God preserves. That's how important it is to him. He wants to preserve it. He wants to remember what we say about him. You know, occasionally... We get email with pictures of memories, right? Here's a memory from one year ago or five years ago. We get we get that. Uh, this comes automatically yeah? if you take uh, digital photos and you're on Google. In the 80s and 90s, the 1980s and the 1990s, our family took a lot of pictures, not digital pictures. We have thousands of printed pictures and envelopes and boxes in our attic. And my wife has over years has spent hours just calling through all of these pictures and trying to put together uh, a, a, um, a memory book for each one of the children. And uh, of course the pictures are, they're precious to us. They're very special to our family. 
because they all capture a special moment that uh, we don't want to forget. God has a book of remembrance. You might say God has a special memory book of his people. There, and these things are very, these sayings are very precious to him. So he preserves them. That's something. He doesn't, he doesn't forget them. What we say about him, it's reverent. That blesses him. What else does he do? Verse 17. He says, and they, these people that fear the Lord, that speak often to another, and the Lord listens intently. These people, God says, will be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. They'll be mine, God says. <clears throat> he possesses people that lovingly speak of him. God gives a special promise here. He gladly declares that he is an owner of this faithful remnant. That God delights in those that delight in him. And he registers their meditation and uh, their verbalized God thoughts. And one day he says, I'm going to gather these people as my own and bring them forever into my literal presence. They're my possession. In fact, not only are they my possession, but God says they're precious to me. Look at verse 17 again. He says, they'll be mine in the day that I make up my jewels. You know what the word jewels literally means? Special treasure. Special treasure. These people that fear the Lord, that reverence him, and speak often one to another of him, he possesses them and calls them his special treasure. When you think about God looking on you or me that way, it's really humbling. It ought to fill us with awe. Us? His jewels? <laughs> his special treasures? I mean, I know myself. I know the sinful man that I am. And yet, he would consider me his special treasure, his jewel, this holy God. You know what that does to me? And this is why I thought I should share it with you all. It stimulates me to want to live up to that. If that's what God thinks of me, then I, I want to be like that. I want to be one of these people in verse 16, that fears the Lord, that reverences him, that reflects upon him, and that verbalizes and shares my God thoughts about him with others like you, not just from a pulpit, but in one-on-one -on -one conversation as well. I want to live up to that. I want a careful, close walk with the Lord like he describes these people. I want that kind. You know, I know that we're we're city dwellers, <clears throat> but I, I came across this illustration I thought was would be understood anyway, even though it's agricultural. This guy said some people they 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 want to love God in the same way that a farmer would love a cow. You love a cow for the milk it gives you for the cheese that you can make from that milk. In other words, you love a cow as a farmer for your own profit. So do people love God just for the sake of what he gives them, whether it be outward riches or inward peace and consolation. But they don't love God correctly, this man says, for they merely love God for their own advantage. 
what he gives them, whether it be outward or inward. Where he says we're looking for something along with God and behaving exactly as if we were making of God a candle so that we can have a light to look for something in the dark. And when we find the things that we're looking for, then we throw the candle away. He says, whatever we seek along with God is nothing. It doesn't matter what it is. Be it an advantage or reward or a kind of spirituality or whatever else, we are seeking a nothingness. And for this reason, we find a, a nothingness. Which, of course, simply means this. Seek the Lord for simply himself. And when you seek the Lord for just who he is, and not for what you can get out of him, not for what he can give you, and he does give. There's all kinds of provision. But seek God for simply who he is, and when you do that, you know what? You'll really have something to talk about. You will be able, like these people who reverence God, to speak often to each other about how wonderful your God is. Just based upon his character alone, how good God is, how faithful he is, how holy he is, how righteous he is, how loving he is how perfect he is, and on and on and on. I encourage you to look in the Bible, and as you read, get a sense of the character of God, who he is. Oh, he's a giving God, yes. And why is he a giving God? What is it that makes, and I, I say this reverently, what is it that makes God tick, you know? We say that about people. What's at the basis of who he is? Well, when you find things like that, share it, will you? Verbalize it. Share it among yourselves. Speak often together about the goodness and the greatness of your God.